everybody, so I warn you, this video is going to be both extremely interesting and extremely dull because what I want you to do is watch something for a little bit, okay? We've got two rotors here. Now, obviously, we're using these uh, generators and all kinds of things, including wind turbines. We have two rotors, and I'm going to spin them for you. What we're interested in is which one stops first. Now the rotors are roughly the same mass, there's a slight difference in the um, diameter of them. I turned them by hand so I don't doubt there's a difference in the force that I applied, etc, etc, etc. So it's very rough and ready, but it's rough and ready because that's all it needs to be. What we're interested in is which one stops first. first because that's a mechanical bearing. It's actually a thrust bearing under there. If we lift that up, there we go. It's a three-part thrust bearing sitting right there taking the weight of this load. And the thrust bearing is just two metal rings with an indent in them and then some ball bearings in between. And when we put a weight on that, we can take that weight and continue to turn. And it's not a bad thrust bearing. Now this will experience a sideways force, that is it's going to be moving that way, and so in there is a couple of ceramic bearings to help with that sideways force. That is pretty free spinning, but clearly nowhere near what this is. That's why I was rough and ready with it, because this spins for so much longer. This is why we're watching it. What I want you to see is how much longer this will spin because it's knock your socks off stuff and you don't get an appreciation of how long it will spin because, you know, who sits and watches these kind of things. So I just want you to see that this will spin a stupid amount of time in comparison to the thrust bearing that we've been using. And of course, thrust bearings aren't bad. We've got some fairly good results out of this, but this is still going strong. I feel tempted to play some um, harmless waiting music, the kind of thing that you get in a lift or a mall. But it's nearly over. <laughs> Congratulations if you got this far. <laughs> okay, that's enough. Eh? But that clearly spins for absolutely ages. And of course, the question is, what's under there? Well, what's under there is a couple of ring magnets. There we go. We've got a north face and a north face in these two ring magnets. As we know, if we get two like poles apart, they'll try to force each other apart. And remember, the strength of that force is 1 over the square of the distance. So the strength of the force is 1 ninth if it's 3 centimetres apart, 1 quarter if it's 2 centimetres apart, and 1 if it's 1 centimetre apart. The force gets very much stronger the nearer that you get, or if you like, very much weaker, the further away that you get. So when we put that in here, and we have our rotor on top, then the mass of the rotor will press down on that lower one, raising it up a little bit, and it needs to raise it enough so that they're not touching. The minute they're not touching, that's a magnetic bearing. A magnetic bearing is defined as a bearing where the magnetism takes the load of the weight that's been applied. And of course, we're going to put rotors and that kind of thing and wind turbines on this. So that will press down a little bit, but as long as you're rotor or wind turbine isn't enough to jam those together, that's going to perform its function of the magnetic bearing. And once it does that, of course, then it's just going to spin for absolutely ages. Now, there are two kinds of magnetic bearings. There's something called the active magnetic bearing and something called the passive. This is passive in that we just use permanent magnets to do that. Now, the problem with permanent magnets is they won't balance on each other. Not if they're still. 
If they're rotating, then they will balance, and that's what the Levitron toy is based on. But if they're still, they'll obey something called Earnshaw's theorem. And Earnshaw's theorem says you can't balance two magnets. They will experience a sideways force. They'll try to fly off from each other, and we can see that easily enough. If I pop that on there, and I let it go gently, you'll see that the magnet gets pushed over to one side. That's Earnshaw's theorem. You can't balance one on top of each other. And that's obviously a bit of a shame, but that's exactly what that is for, because you can get it to be a passive magnetic bearing as long as you put a restraint to overcome that shove it away from Earnshaw's theorem. And that's why we have bearings in here, because this also experiences sideways force, but it's stopped by the bearings, and of course those are ceramic bearings. So we do have some friction in the bearings here to overcome Earnshaw's theorem, but no friction in the bit here, apart from the air friction, obviously, that it's passing through. And that's passive bearings. They're stunningly simple to make. They are basically just two ring magnets restrained. So that ring magnet you can get from things like speakers, or you can just buy them on Amazon, so you get exactly where I bought that from. It's a ceramic ring magnet with one and a half two rows of lift force. Pop that in there, pop your rotor on the top, it's got that restraint on it. There we go, and we have ourselves a passive magnetic bearing. Now, magnetic bearings are used a lot, but not very often in this passive form. They're used mostly in what's called active magnetic bearings, where there's a feedback mechanism to turn the electromagnet off and on, and in which case you don't need this restraining bar. The great thing about those is you get a wobble in something when the centre of rotation, that is bit here, is different from the centre of mass, where the centre of the mass of the rotor is. If you do that, it'll wobble. Magnetic bearing can take account of that, and so you can get a beautifully smooth turning, even if your rotor isn't as good as perhaps it should be. Of course, what we do is just put up with the wobble and maybe build things a little bit stronger. Now, OK, watch this. on a flat disc with no veins or anything and I can get it to turn and that's the effect that the reduction in friction has. So imagine if that was actually a wind turbine, it's going to turn with a baby's breath on it because I can get that to turn by just gently blowing on the side of the disc which is incredible when you think about it. So of course this kind of bearing is going to be particularly good for a wind turbine. Now don't get me wrong, Passive bearings can get very complicated in their geometry, and there's certainly a lot of research going in on them. But the simplest bearing to make, two ring magnets and a spike in the centre, is stupidly easy to make, and you still get a huge performance benefit from just doing that. There are other issues involved with them, for instance the size of the magnet, the interference with the generation, etc, etc, etc. But in their basic form, they're really easy to make, they give a great performance boost to what you might be making, and they're ideally suited for something like wind turbines, where, let's face it, we don't get huge amounts of wind in England. We get an average wind speed of 4.5 metres per second, so anything we can scavenge from that is going to be a benefit, and what we can do to reduce friction and get more out of it, then no it's well worth looking at. So I thought I would talk about magnetic bearings, how they stack up against ordinary thrust bearings. We'll, we'll be using this, I haven't used it yet, but we're going to be using this in future designs. I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope it inspires you. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.